Good morning, Dr. Ellingson. What I would like to talk with you about this morning is what I am calling the oral history of the Institute. Because of the tremendously important part which you had to play over a period of more than 40 years in the life of the Institute, I am looking forward to considerable anticipation to this interview. And I would like to have you chat with me as to some of the things that you feel were important during the period that you were at the Institute. You might do this chronologically by decades, or it might be done by educational innovations that were introduced and fostered by RIT, or it might be the impact of RIT upon the community, the community on RIT. In any event, I should like very much to have you chat with me as if I were a stranger to Rochester, and you're bringing me up to date on what happened during these momentous years while you were at RIT. All right? Go ahead. <clears throat> that you are a stranger, I will begin with the founding of the Institute which took place in the year 1829 and was founded as the Rochester Athenaeum. It is interesting to note that uh, Rochester at that time was a frontier village and the leading citizens felt that they ought to bring some of the cultural events and the cultural goings-on of a new nation to this frontier town. So back even in 1829, the Institute had its uh, basic objective as uh, one of usefulness to the community. In 1885, the Athenaeum had virtually become uh, extinct. It, it certainly was an inactive organization. And at that time, the Mechanics Institute was founded. And here again, the concern was to give help to the men and women, old and young, who were coming in from the agricultural uh, areas of western New York and finding employment in the then growing and bustling industries of the uh, community. In eight, uh, th this uh, objective was primarily occupational. And in 1829, the two institutions were merged to give us the Rochester Athenaeum and Mechanics Institute with uh, objectives of uh, the living of a life and the earning of a living as a single objective. And this has been pretty well covered by uh, Mr. Hoke in his uh, blazing new trails. So I won't spend much time on that except to say that it was a unique idea that the central core of education had to do with man's occupation but that this was not enough. He had to do something else. He had to be concerned with the, the community. So the Institute, uh, then known as the Rochester Athenaeum and Mechanics Institute. This merger was in 1891. This was in 1891 that the merger took place. And uh, the Institute went on primarily, however, under the impetus of the Mechanics Institute. And the name, the Rochester Athenaeum, gradually drifted out, although the concept uh, was uh, retained throughout the entire uh, history of the Institute. By 1918, the Institute had, uh, had uh, uh, slowed down considerably, but during the war, it uh, started again on an occupational uh, training program for veterans. There's a good deal of very interesting material in the period of 1900 to uh, 1918, but uh, I think that that's really uh, an expansion of another segment of the story. However, by 1920, uh, the Institute had come to a place where the Board of Trustees decided to have a commission 
uh, study the function of the Institute and uh, decide which of the three courses that it might follow. One, it might be closed. Uh, second, it might become a part of some other uh, educational institution, either the Board of Education or the University of Rochester. And third, it might go on its own way. The names of the men on this commission are recorded in history, and uh, I won't go into that, but uh, they came up with the proposal that uh, the Institute, with its uh, unique concern for the concept that every individual should continue to learn as long as he lived, and that the industries themselves would prosper by the increased uh, productivity and the increased capacity of their individuals, individual employees, uh, made this a, a unique kind of a statement in American higher education. Now, the Institute was a pioneer in cooperative work programs also, was it? Not? And the Institute, as I remember, began cooperative work in about 1914 or somewhere in right. there, somewhere in between 1910 and 1920, and was the second educational institution in the United States to begin a cooperative work program. And this, as you know, uh, had to do with the business of tying in man's occupational goal with his, uh, with his educational uh, program. But in any event, in 1920, uh, 1920, this survey was made, and uh, at that time, under the leadership of John A. Randall, uh, there were two educational consultants who were employed. One was W. W. Charters, and the other, Ralph Tyler, who came in to give uh, educational guidance to the members of the faculty in building up a strong program. I came to the Institute in 1926, and at that time, the day school enrollment was around 700, and the evening school enrollment was around 1,200. The Institute had total assets at that time of about a million and a half dollars, uh, about uh, 700,000 in, in uh, endowment funds and had a total budget of approximately $250,000 and incidentally was operating at a deficit of about seventy-five dollars or $80,000 a year. <clears throat> the Institute in 1926 had a capital campaign for $3 million and it failed to raise the three million. It actually raised about a million and a half dollars. And uh, so it was to continue over the next, uh, uh, from 1926, over the next 11 years, operating at a deficit with its enrollment fluctuating up and down, uh, but uh, making good, strong progress from the point of view of uh, education and the educational uh, philosophy, get, giving a strong base uh, which uh, had uh, incorporated in it the concept of continuing education about which we hear now a great deal as if it is a new uh, concept and actually this concept is a very old one as far as the Institute is concerned. The uh, concept of course of uh, making occupation the central core of man's education and uh, tying in some of the liberal or the general concepts is also a, a new, or was a relatively new concept at that time. Well, I served on a committee that worked on the campaign in 1926, and uh, we had a lot of fun, but we didn't raise the money. And uh, uh, it did mean, however, that the Institute Endowment uh, went up a bit and we paid off some of the debts that uh, had been accumulated over the period of years. And uh, our enrollment uh, fluctuated. It went from uh, about 700 up to about 850. And then, just at the end of the first 100 years of uh, this institution, namely 1929, we ran into the Depression. and. Uh, the Depression took its toll on all educational institutions throughout the United States. In general, enrollment tended to drop, 
and uh, during this period the enrollment dropped from about 950 to about uh, 560. Uh, the uh, budget, however, we were not able to cut that back as much despite the fact that we had a 20 percent uh, pay cut uh, and by 19 uh, uh, 33, which was at the depth of the depression, the budget had been cut from $250,000 to $202,000, and our deficit actually was cut to about $7,000 in that year. Uh, among other things, in my own uh, career at the Institute, I came here as an instructor in economics and was brought here by Calvin Thomas, who at the time was head of what is now called general education. Uh, the student athletic life was exceedingly limited at the time, and uh, the students asked me if I would uh, undertake the uh, coaching of the wrestling team, which I started, and uh, which all gave a lot of fun to me and a lot of satisfaction to the students themselves because. We were operating on a three-year program, and yet we were competing against four-year people. And uh, this program, I think, was uh, very successful. Uh, so the start of the second century of this institution uh, came at a time when the economic climate was certainly bleak and uh, at a time when many people felt that there really was not... Uh, uh, much hope for this institution. What was the attitude of the industrial leaders at this time, Mark? The industrial uh, leaders were yes. very, very cooperative. And uh, in 1936, I was made president of the institute, and one of the first things that we did was to go to some of the leading industrialists and I remember very distinctly going to Mr. Frank Lovejoy, who was president of Eastern Kodak, and saying to him somewhat to, to the effect that, uh, well, Mr. Lovejoy, the uh, future of the Institute is at stake. We simply cannot continue operating at a deficit, deficit, and unless the Institute is really worth something to the Rochester Industries, uh, then we'd better try to find some other uh, avenue toward which it can uh, can go. Mr. Lovejoy at that time said, well, the Institute is very, very much worthwhile to Rochester industry, and the Eastman Kodak will contribute $50,000 a year uh, to the annual budget. That was the beginning of what we call the industrial corporate contracts or corporate supports support uh, for the Institute. By virtue of the fact that we were training literally hundreds and hundreds of employees from uh, virtually all of the industries of Rochester. We raised a very substantial amount of money on an annual basis that year, and uh, beginning in the year 1936, uh, 37, we had it, our, our deficit, a deficit of 17,000, but beginning the year after, we went into a long period where each year we had a little more money that we had taken in than we actually were able to, than, than we actually had spent. In the meantime, the the assets of the institute uh, had uh, begun to grow. Uh, we raised uh, money for uh, buildings and uh, uh, raised money for modernization and improvement, and we began to really uh, get to industry on the proposition that it would be easier to to raise the uh, level of each employee than it would be to go out and hunt up new employees. Well, so, when did the uh, practice of the industries reimbursing their employees' uh, tuition for attending night classes? Well, well that did not that come until a little later. Mm -hmm. That is, at, th at that time, there were some industries that were giving a, a uh, 50% rebate provided the uh, the uh, uh, industry provided the individual finished the course, but this did not come until a, a later time. I think probably it was during World War II that 
most of this uh, uh, came about. But in any event, uh, the uh, evening, evening, for example, evening enrollment, uh, beginning uh, uh, in 1936, took a, a very big jump from 17 to 2,500. It went to 27, it went to 36, it went, and so on. Well, then with the actual coming of the war, uh, we found that our enrollment in both day and evening school uh, was reduced, but at the same time, the Institute was running 24 hours a day in many of our departments. The Institute had taken the position that what the industries and the employees of the industries needed, the Institute would be willing to, to uh, carry on. Well, with the uh, ending of the war, we had raised enough money to build the Clark Building. In the meantime, however, beginning in 1930, we had started the photographic department. In 1936, 1937, I guess it was, we had started the printing department. And these departments grew very, very rapidly. It was much later that we... Uh, started the business department, business administration department, and the School for American Craftsmen. But in the meantime, <clears throat> the Institute continued to grow and continued to, uh, to uh, get uh, increasing support. And I think the reason it got increasing support is that uh, you can't have uh, a steady flow of employees going into an industry without uh, its uh, making a dent upon the attitude of the community. At one time, one of the leading industries in Rochester made a survey of uh, their employees who had taken work at the Institute, and they discovered that approximately 50% of their employees had, at one time or another, taken some kind of work. They'd either been cooperative students, or they'd taken evening school work, or something of this kind. Now, late in the 1920s, didn't Mr. Thomason begin the management program, which grew to yes, a considerable uh, size? He, he took the position, he took the position that uh, there was a science to management, and that there was a way in which men could, uh, could uh, motivate and supervise people. And he began then a management program which has grown very, very substantially and was, I think, one of the forerunners of uh, many of the short intensive courses that are now designed for uh, b both uh, middle management and upper management uh, uh, for them to get uh, control over some of the factors uh, in their own uh, areas. Now you've raised some questions here as to, uh, I think, all during this time, the uh, respect of the community had been increasing for the Institute, although I think many people didn't actually know what the Institute was. And uh, time and again, we would find people who would come through the Institute who would say, well, I just had no idea that you had facilities of this kind. I had no idea that you had as big a program. Uh, and actually, as you look down over the list of, uh, of total people that we touched or gave some form of education to, you find that uh, rising up into the, the uh, uh, 5,000, the 6,000, the 7,000s, uh, moving up into the, uh, finally, the 10,000s, the 11, the 12, and the 15,000 uh, groups, so that the Institute really had a very substantial uh, number of people although it was considerably different because we touched people in so many different ways uh, and in general we touched only a small segment of their own life. They would come for specific kinds of, uh, of programs. Now, I don't know quite what you want me to, to uh, talk about from here on. The, uh, why, don't, why don't we just stop all right, yeah. I think it would be interesting to, uh, to tell you just a little about the fact that uh, the Institute uh, in 1929 set up uh, really an educational research committee. 
the purpose of which was to get outside consultants to help us improve the educational process. Uh, we employed, as I've indicated before, W.W. W. Charters and Ralph Tyler. Uh, later we had Daniel Prescott, uh, who was concerned with the emotional aspects of learning. But uh, in the early days of 20, uh, 29 and 30 and 31 and 32, uh, charters came to the Institute uh, 20 days a year. And Tyler came to the Institute 10 days a year. Uh, there was an educational research committee set up. And uh, this committee met with uh, charters and Tyler. We would review the projects of uh, various departments as to what the departments had done and what they were doing and uh, during this period we had a good many experimental um, projects. One had to do with the anecdotal behavior record where we felt that uh, if one could get a series of samples of the behavior of an individual student that uh, you could begin to find out what the pattern of the student was. Another was the activity analysis. Another was the job chart where uh, you would sharpen up the, the objectives of a department by saying, here is a cluster or family of jobs. And uh, uh, while the objective is a certain job, there are training jobs and intermediate jobs that one has to go through because one doesn't uh, spring uh, fully uh, born into a uh, uh, the kind of a job that one is heading for as a, a terminal uh, occupational job. Tyler, Tyler and, uh, was concerned with the evaluation uh, aspect of this, charters with the curriculum construction, and uh, uh, we did a good deal of work with uh, that, uh, I think, uh, contributed uh, to the understanding on the part of the faculty and uh, on the part of uh, the administration as to purposes of the institute. Now you served as chairman of that uh, Education Research Committee from its founding, did you not? Until yes, yes I did. I, I served as uh, chairman until uh, I became president. And this was a very uh, educational uh, experience for me because during during this period and during the, during the uh, Depression period, since we were not able to uh, have uh, faculty members on a full-time basis. I took five months off each year and went to the University of Chicago and later to Ohio State University where I completed my work for a PhD. Uh, many of the uh, faculty members did the same thing. Well, all through this uh, period, uh, I always had a feeling of very great satisfaction about what the Institute was doing. Uh, there was a, a personal touch about uh, the Institute that I felt was very, very good. I felt our teachers were concerned primarily with teaching rather than with research. And I think that this was an element of strength uh, for the Institute during these uh, years. And then, too, I saw people who, who would go through the cooperative work jobs who would stay with the company and who would uh, move up and who would become prominent in their own field. And of course, uh, one can't be affiliated with a, uh, an educational institution for 40 or 45 years without seeing a lot of highly successful uh, uh, men and women. Uh, we have had uh, people who have done uh, very great jobs. Uh, Lou Wilson, who was Commissioner of Education, was one of the Institute uh, graduates. Norman Collister, uh, an outstanding person. Uh, Norm Kramer was an outstanding uh, person in his uh, field. And uh, I am sure that if I uh, look down the list of uh, all of our graduates, I could find hundreds of people who had, who had done very, very well, first in their occupational field, and secondly, uh, as citizens in their community who had been uh, very much interested in uh, their community and who had contributed uh, very much uh, to them. Well, the Institute went on. Uh, we had built the Clark Building in 
1954, we built the Ritter-Clark building as uh, the first time the Institute had had any health or recreational facilities. Now, the uh, Clark building was finished in about 1946, just in That is right. We had raised the money during, the world, during World War II for the building of the Clark building and had our plans all made so that just as soon as we were able to get uh, materials, we started this building, and it was built in 1946. This gave us a tremendous expanse in, in photography and printing and, uh, and uh, uh, loosened up the space situation throughout the Institute. We, uh, we continued in this location, and uh, somewhere along that time, uh, we were able to get uh, 50 Main Street. Uh, which was given to us over a 20-year period by the, the federal government, provided we would use it for educational purposes. This again gave us an opportunity to uh, to expand our business program very, very materially, and to uh, give a uh, floor space and room to uh, build up what was then the the beginning roots of uh, of the modern. RIT. Now you speak of the modern RIT. Uh, we have not touched on the, the point at which the name change took place and this whole area when the Institute uh, moved from a three-year technical institute to a degree-granting institution. Well, I'm a little fuzzy on the dates on this, but uh, our students had long been uh, irritated by the Athenaeum and Mechanics Institute. Yeah concept. And uh, over a period of years, we had discussed the question of changing of names uh, with the Board of Trustees. And uh, as usual, there were many Board of Trustees uh, uh, who were uh, opposed to the change. But in 1944, we finally uh, persuaded our Board of Trustees to let us go to the Board of Regents and ask the Board of Regents for permission to change the name of the Institute uh, from uh, Rochester Athenaeum and Mechanics Institute to the Rochester Institute of Technology. A lot of very interesting experiences there. Uh, one, the University of Rochester opposed very much this uh, change. And they appeared before the Board of Regents and say that, said that it would be misleading uh, for the Institute to take this name. And I have a feeling of great gratitude to uh, Miss uh, Susan Brandeis, who was on the Board of Regents, who said in substance, uh, what business is it of the University of Rochester if this institution wants to change its name? She was chairman of the committee, and she put the matter, the matter through. So uh, we were at that time also uh, concerned with the, the post-war planning and the Board of Regents worked out a plan which would provide community colleges in many institutions. And there was a period when the, uh, the Institute was looked upon as uh, being a candidate to join the state system. And in some of the Regents' reports, this was uh, incorporated. Now, as I remembered in the planning for these Institutes of Applied Arts and Sciences, as I believe they were called, and which were about 1946, you were an active member of the uh, state committee that was set up to study these, were you not? Well, I served in some capacity. I don't know whether, how active it was. I think you're being overly modest uh, because they were patterned largely after our idea. Well, oh, oh, they were patterned after the Institute. And uh, we spent uh, our first uh, two or three years after, the world, after World War II in playing host to the boards of trustees of, of uh, institutions all over the state. And the state of New York patterned these uh, institutions after the institute. I think it was about uh, this time that uh, we said to the state that they should grant degrees for two years of work. And we were the first institution to grant the associate uh, in applied science degree. Uh, this was for the two, for two and three years of work. Well, with the coming of the community colleges, we felt that we ought to add on to the uh, work of the institute and that we should become a, a degree-granting institution. 
And at this point, we had a lot of uh, very uh, sharp arguments with the uh, Board of Regents uh, concerning the fact that we did not wish to change our objectives, that we wanted to just move on, that, that uh, uh, knowledge was increasing and that uh, we should not become a liberal arts college and we should not become an engineering college and we should become a technological institution. And uh, finally, we were granted... Now, there is another interesting uh, development about 1950, as I remember. I believe that the School for American Craftsmen came to RIT about that time. Would you want to trace the history of that? Okay. Carol Newsom was the Commissioner of Education at the time, and on one occasion I was chatting with him, and he told me that uh, there was a, a school called the School for American Craftsmen, which had originated at Dartmouth under the leadership of Mrs. Vanderbilt Webb, had later gone to Alfred and was having some problems with Alfred. Uh, uh, the School for American Craftsmen was, uh, not, uh, did not fit in with the liberal arts uh, program, and uh, uh, he suggested that I go to New York and talk with Mrs. Webb concerning this and, and see if uh, they wouldn't be interested in coming to the Institute. Uh, Mrs. Webb, uh, I found to be a charming and a dynamic, uh, able woman uh, who had uh, set up the uh, American Crafts Council, who had set up uh, America House as an outlet for craftsmen, and who had set up Craft Horizons as a uh, publication for the crafts field, and in addition, the School for American Craftsmen. She was very much interested in it. and. Uh, I think it was 1950 that it actually came to the Institute with uh, uh, financial support from Mrs. Webb. And uh, it became an integral part of the Institute at that time. Here was a case where uh, the hand crafts, in contrast to the machine crafts, were being brought in and uh, uh, given a tremendous lift in respectability and uh, uh, giving people who were interested in these fields an opportunity to become competent craftsmen and go into one of uh, two or three fields. One, they could set up uh, shops of their own. Uh, they could uh, become teachers of crafts. I guess the third field was that uh, they could become designers in uh, uh, manufacturing concerns that utilized these crafts. As I remember, there were about four majors. Yes, the, there were four majors. Crafts. There was uh, uh, wood, uh, ceramics, uh, wood, ceramics, metal, and uh, textiles. And those four areas have uh, continued and have turned out to uh, uh, people of tremendous talent and have attracted people from all over the world. American Crafts, uh, the, Ameri the School for American Craftsmen is certainly uh, a, a, uh, an excellent uh, show window on one very interesting facet of uh, Institute of Life. We've had some outstanding craftsmen on the faculty there, and of course Harold Brennan came as a uh, director of that school, did he not, from Alfred? Yes, Harold came uh, and has been, was the, was the director from 1950 until the time he retired in uh, six, 70, uh, 70, one or, one or so. Mm -hmm. Well, now, a couple of years later, did uh, the Institute take over the McKechnie Lunger School of Commerce? Yes, we had long toyed with the idea as to whether or not we should uh, have a school of business. And... Uh, the McKechnie Lunger was having, a school of business was having a, a, a hard time. They simply were not able to attract people. They could not grant degrees. They were a proprietary school. And uh, we bought the few remaining assets that they had and uh, uh, took over two or three of their staff members. And uh, this gave us the nucleus of a I think I should say, Leo, that uh, I have uh, 
somewhat purposely omitted the very significant uh, part that you have played in the development of the Institute. <laughs> Shut the clock. Now, another question I have, Dr. Ellingson, is that over the years, uh, obviously the Institute was growing in size from the standpoint of enrollment and in uh, financial backing and background and endowment. Uh, this certainly represents an increasing uh, favorable attitude on the part of the business and industrial community. Did you want to uh, trace that? I think that, that that came about primarily because of service. The, uh, the Institute's attitude of service to human beings and to the industries in which they were employed over a long period of time uh, gained increasing uh, respect on the part of business and industry and individual donors. The Institute continued to grow, and in 1960, it was obvious uh, that we would have to make some drastic moves if the Institute were to continue its growth pattern. Uh, we would either have to, to raise substantial amounts of money downtown and try to gear in with an urban renewal program or move outside. The study of educational institutions has indicated that almost all institutions that have had an opportunity to move and failed to move have regretted it later, and that those institutions that have moved have felt that it was the right thing to do. However, we took about a year and a half or two years and had a study with the advantages and disadvantages of downtown as against an outside location. And uh, somewhere in the early 60s, we made the decision that we would get some 1,300 acres of land on the outside of town, and that uh, we would attempt to raise approximately $18 million in order to do this and that we would borrow the remaining money. About this time, uh, I was uh, in my office at, uh, on Plymouth Avenue and a young lady came in with, an, with a letter from Fred Weedman, a local attorney, in which he told me, in which the letter said that uh, Mrs. Grace Watson had left uh, the residue of her estate, which was approximately $2 million, to the Institute. This was the biggest uh, request the Institute had had at that time, and was just enough to, to uh, make it feasible for us to attempt to raise an additional uh, $16 million. Well, we went on and, and raised about $18 or $19 million. We built a uh, completely new campus, and uh, I needn't go into the uh, blood, sweat, and tears that were expended on either the campaign. We didn't make the campaign goal by the end of the campaign. It was another year before we finally rounded up the money. We borrowed $50 million from the dormitory authority. Uh, we hired a, a series of, of architectural teams. Uh, and uh, if you want the record of these, why it's on the record and you can record in here the, the uh, uh, architects. Uh, but uh, we, we finished the, or almost finished the campus, and then we were compelled to move into it. So we had a period of uh, very uh, abrasive uh, times while we were trying to operate two campuses at once and move our, the rest of the people from downtown. But I am convinced that, uh, and it's interesting to note, that there are five or six of the members of the board who voted against the move. Some of the members of the board who voted against it are dead. Uh, most of those who are still living have already said, well, it was a mistake to vote against it that they have agreed that this was the thing to do. I am certain that had the Institute uh, remained downtown with its uh, focal or central operation, that uh, it simply could not have survived. In the meantime, however, we have kept 50 Main Street West as a, a, an urban center, and this gives us a very excellent uh, combination of facilities, a facilities for, for 
downtown work and the facilities for our campus work. Um, As I think you look in another back 10 years, that we will have shaken down out most of the bugs on the new campus. As you look uh, over the old uh, downtown campus and see what's happened with the inner loop being cut diagonally across from it, uh, you've already said you feel that we, we could not have continued downtown. What, uh, what do you think would have happened? Would our enrollment have dropped off? The, uh... I think we would have had no, almost no women students. Uh, the downtown area, people downtown don't like it. Uh, it's, a, it's not a good area for women students. Uh, Drexel Institute in Philadelphia had a somewhat similar problem. And uh, they found this made a, a very serious impact on their enrollment. Uh, the state... Uh, cut our, our downtown campus, which wasn't much of a campus, exactly in two, and took some 18 or 19 uh, individual pieces of property, including a library, a, a six-story uh, residence hall for women, uh, two or three apartment houses, and uh, a lot of other space. I do not see how the Institute could have remained downtown without uh, doing irreparable damage to thousands of families in this area whose property would have been condemned uh, for more space for the Institute. Columbia University is in that situation now where uh, for seven or eight years they've been held up on a gymnasium because uh, uh, they've taken so much uh, property and have displaced so many people. And whether we like it or not, the social structure does not, uh, will tear down uh, housing before it builds new housing to put people in. So we've got a, a real housing problem in, in uh, Rochester. But had the Institute stayed downtown, I think it would have been, uh, I just think it couldn't, we couldn't possibly have gotten the support, we couldn't possibly have gotten the facilities that we have present time. Well, Dr. Ellingson, some of the board members had an active and dynamic interest in the Institute over the years. I wonder if you would want to sketch that a little bit. The Institute has always had uh, strong board members. Uh, I am almost reluctant to talk about any one of them for fear of leaving out someone whose major uh, contribution uh, might uh, go unnoticed. But let me talk about a few of the people of our board. Carl Long was chairman of the board when I became president, and uh, he had the tenacity and doggedness to keep the Institute alive at a time when uh, it was on the verge of uh, going under. He was a strong believer in, in, in it. And although he did not uh, contribute uh, substantially uh, financially, uh, he had great strength and great enthusiasm for it. Um, James Gleason was the next uh, chairman of the board. And uh, he too was a man of great uh, energy. He too was a man of great energy and vision and uh, made e enormous contributions to the Institute. I think one of Mr. Gleason's uh, major contributions was the insistence on moving and the insistence on getting adequate land. He had already lived through the University of Rochester's uh, period of growth uh, to the new river campus and securing 80 acres. And he had said that uh, this was an entirely inadequate for the university. And the years have shown him to be right. Uh, he told me on many occasions not to show up with 100 or 200 acres of land. And when we finally did get 1,300 acres of land, he said, well, this is more like it. This is the kind of space that we ought to have. You will never know, said Mr. Gleason, the uh, uh, 
tasks that the social structure will place upon the educational institutions and have plenty of room. <coughs> he also uh, gave substantially to the Institute and his trusts have given substantially to the Institute over a period of years. Another man who had great strength and uh, great faith in the Institute was George H. Clark. And I could talk for hours about Mr. Clark and his great modesty and his enthusiasm for the Institute and uh, his uh, very substantial financial uh, contributions. Uh, he uh, strongly believed that uh, people ought to earn a living and that education ought to uh, help them in the process of becoming occupationally uh, competent. Wasn't it Mr. Clark that was the anonymous donor that yes. started the uh, campaign which we had about uh, the yes, early 1940s? Yes, Mr. Clark was the anonymous don donor where he gave four dollars for every six that uh, was raised. Uh, he left a, uh, enough in his will so that uh, with uh, other contributions we were able to build the Ritter-Clark building. The Clark building itself was built uh, from uh, public donations and was named simply to honor uh, Mr. Clark himself. Uh, Frank Gannett uh, was the founder of the Old Empire State School of Printing, uh, which was the forerunner of the present School of Printing. And it was Frank Gannett who brought the School of Printing uh, to the Institute in uh, 1937 from Ithaca and uh, gave it its start uh, to its uh, uh, present uh, uh, level of uh, enrollment and achievement and uh, comprehensiveness. Frank Gannett was a great uh, contributor to the Institute and a great supporter of the Institute. Um, Chester Carlson uh, uh, comes high on the list of uh, contributors to the Institute. He was a very modest man, uh, but uh, his contributions to the Institute run in the neighborhood of $2 million uh, over a very short span of uh, time that uh, he became interested in it. Mrs. Webb was another contributor to the Institute not only of money, but of ideas, and as I've already indicated, she was the founder of the School for American Crafts. Uh, these are just a few. Uh, William B. Hale, Ezra Hale's father, was a staunch supporter. Uh, in turn, uh, his uh, mother, as I remember, had been, uh, or at least Ezra Hale's grandfather, had been on the board. E.R. E. E. Andrews and Mrs. Andrews had been on the board. Uh, Mr. Hale was on the board, and then Ezra and uh, Joe Hale were on the board as well. Uh, Frank Ritter was a much more modest contributor in money, but uh, contributed substantially to uh, ideas. If one gets into the present uh, Board of Trustees and the honorary members, one has a whole series of uh, people who have contributed ideas and have uh, contributed strength to uh, the Institute. Now, do you have any other questions that you want to Dr. Ellingson, one uh, item I know that was always close to your heart was the work in the evening college, what is now known as <coughs> our College of Continuing Education. And uh, I wonder if this isn't something that has been extremely important in the eyes of the industrial and business leaders in the community. There is no doubt but that the College of Continuing Education uh, is a direct uh, reflection of the early attitude of uh, people on the board that education is a continuing process that every individual ought to continue his education and that this was a way whereby this could be formalized uh, the the absolutely fantastic growth 
of uh, continuing education or of adult education, or call it what you will, is uh, an evidence that uh, man is a learning animal and that uh, the learning process does not cease until man himself is about through his journey on this earth. <coughs> if uh, one takes the case of the little messenger girl who takes typing and becomes a typist as a step up, and the typist who takes uh, uh, shorthand and stenography as a step up to the secretaryship, and and the secretary who takes accounting as a next step up, and the accountant who, who uh, takes uh, additional work and becomes a controller, uh, all of these are illustrative of the fact that man has within his own power the, uh, the uh, capacity or the capability of moving ahead. Uh, this concept has long been uh, running through the uh, history of the Institute in uh, many, many ways. And the College of Continuing Education is an exemplification and a formalization of this in such a way uh, as to uh, place greater emphasis on it. Uh, there is no doubt but that uh, this is attractive from the point of view of management. Uh, management can uh, take individuals. Uh, who need additional skills and give them uh, short intensive courses and move them up. Uh, top management itself uh, takes uh, short additional courses and uh, it too can uh, keep up with the changing uh, technology and the changing time. So I think that you're right, uh, Leo, that the uh, College of Continuing Education is uh, illustration of a deep-seated fundamental principle uh, that man continues to learn and that the avenues for learning must be kept open. The individual who cannot speak English must learn how to speak it if he's to live in this country. The individual who, uh, who cannot uh, read and write, who is illiterate, must learn. There's too much at stake from the point of view of the individual uh, to uh, let these things uh, go on by chance. And the College of Continuing Education uh, has done a great deal from courses that uh, range from, I think, probably the eighth grade level to, college, to courses that are certainly on the PhD level. Uh, these have all been offered under the very broad banner of uh, continued education. Certainly this management program that Calvin Thomas started back in the late 1920s and has been running now for more than four decades, the three-year management program and the diplomas that are offered at the end of that must have had an important uh, impact upon the supervisory personnel here in Rochester. I am sure that it did, and as I've indicated before, that uh, the studies that have been made about the number of people that have attended RIT is an absolutely phenomenal in the Rochester area. Of course, in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, Rochester has had a broader base uh, from the point of view of geography. Uh, people go farther, they come farther. We are in uh, programs that in some cases are not directly geared to, uh, to industry, but that are geared more to the needs of uh, the individual, wherever he may be. But uh, the, the fundamental principle is the same. Well, this leads into another thought that has occurred to me, or at least a question. Uh, when I first came to Rochester in 1939, the great majority of the industries in the city were locally owned. Uh, since World War II in particular, this uh, local ownership has shifted. Till now, many of the industries are parts of national corporations. Uh, as you look down the road ahead, uh, what impact do you think this is going to have upon the support of the Institute financially and also upon the psychological support of the Institute? There is no doubt but that uh, uh, the ownership of a corporation 
that lies outside the community uh, makes it much more difficult for the institute to secure support. However, in the case of the, the uh, printing industry, we have had very excellent support from uh, the manufacturers of printing equipment. We have had relatively little support from uh, the uh, uh, printing industry itself. The newspapers, the book manufacturers, the, uh, the commercial printers, these people are not willing to support this to the same extent that uh, local industries will, uh, will support a program that is useful for their field. Uh, there just is uh, there just isn't uh, there just is not the support uh, except as uh, in the printing field you find the printing equipment people they have done more than their share the printers themselves have done relatively little. Well, Dr. Ellingson, we are coming to almost the end of this tape. Perhaps now we should stop for a while and uh, come back, get together at a later time. I certainly appreciate your willingness to give this time and to throw some light on the earlier history as you remember from your experience. Thank you very much.